And here we are coming to you live once again from the very, very top secret broadcasting bunker high above the sanctuary of Bethel Church. This is Pastor Mike and I'm online and I am alive today and hopefully I stay that way live and healthy for quite a long time. Today will probably go down in history as the day that America turned into a socialist nation. Today is the birth of Obamacare. And if you saw the uh, speech last night, President Obama jumps out there. He looks very, he's ticked off. He's mad because the, the, what he describes as one party in one house in one section of government the extreme right is blocking, uh, or is trying to block his Obamacare bill, trying to marginalize and fraction, fraction off or fractionalize, if that's even a word. People that he refers to as the far right, people who let's see what it, what does it take to what does it take to be on the far right? People who believe in limited government. People who believe and hold to the idea that America is not a democracy. It is a constitutional representative republic. That's what, the, that's what it takes to be on the far right. Uh, so limited government, a constitutional representative republic. The fact that the Constitution should be the rule of law. Uh, and not bureaucracy, not uh, the whims of whoever is in charge. Uh, people who don't want to pay higher taxes for, for any reason whatsoever. Uh, people who don't want government-subsidized abortions. People who don't want those who are in this country illegally without law, without the jurisdiction and the benefit of law. People who don't want people who are in this country illegally to receive government benefits of any kind, including a driver's license, government benefits, including but not limited to free health care for life paid for by the legal taxed working citizens of the United States of America. That's what it, that's apparently, that's what he's got in mind as far as who's on the far right concern. I, I watched his speech last night. Of course, he didn't get a choice. Uh, and you could just see the guy is angry. He's ticked off that people are opposing him. Well, get used to it, Mr. President. Everybody in every walk of life needs resistance. Everybody does. I do. I need resistance. I, I, I don't ever need or want a situation in life where my wife just does everything I demand her to do without question. I don't want a situation where my church just rolls over for old Pastor Mike. You know, he's the pastor. Whatever he says goes. I don't want that. Now, there's a way to do it right and a way to do it wrong, but I don't ever want a situation where anybody in this church just rolls over for me, just well, Pastor Mike, whatever he wants to do. That's a, It's good to get resistance, especially on things you believe in. We told our girls when they reached a certain age, they were still living in our house. And, um, and pretty, I think, if I remember right, all of our girls lived in our house until they got married. And then uh, we always told them, look, you're at an age now. You have a driver's license. You're a legal adult. Uh, you have a vehicle. You, can, you, can, you have a job. We're, you're at the age where our ability to tell you what to do with yourself is waning. And it's, and it's going away. You're becoming your own person. But as long as you live in this house, our responsibility to you is, if you're going to make decisions and make your own, 
we're going to make them very difficult for you to make. In other words, we're not just going to roll over. Well, that's what she wants. You know, she can do whatever she wants. She's an adult. Oh, no, no, no. We're going to inject our opinion into it. We're going to tell you where it's going. We're going to tell you where it's headed. We're going to tell you what, what falls down the road. And if you don't want to hear that, that's just too bad. You're still breathing our air-conditioned air in our house. And that's the, that's the way we did it. Same way with uh, Matthew, who's 17 now. And he's, well, I tell you what, he is, he's all grown up big man up here. And we just tell him, look, son, as long as you live here, we're going to make it, we're going to help you make decisions about life. You may not like it, but you know what? That's just how it is. Roll with the punches. But Obama was just ticked last night that, that, why, that people are having a problem with what he's wanting to do. Um, and, he, and he bragged about how. The bill is now law. It was voted on by Congress. Yeah, it was brought. It, that bill had its was bribed its way through, and everybody got a little piece of something out of it in order to vote on it. And ask the question: Who even read the bill before they voted on it? Biggest sham. One of the biggest shams in American history. And uh, he is upset. Today is your day. I feel like Ben the Hen here. Today is your day. This is your day. I promise you this Thursday, or I talked about it, and um, I'm going to give you the opportunity to write in, to send any questions you have, any comments you have, good or bad, doesn't matter. Now, if you're the if you're some of the trollers out there, and you're just all you're going to do is accuse me of being a racist and an idiot, well, then probably today's not your day. It probably isn't. Uh, but anyway, if you got any questions or comments, the email address is on the bottom of the screen, PastorMikeOnline at gmail.com. Looking forward to hearing from you. I do want to do something. Uh, let me do a couple things uh, very quickly here. On, Let me get rid of the lower graphics so you can see the whole thing here. On, Let me pull up my calendar here so I remember. Uh, Monday, October the 21st. Tuesday, October the 22nd, I will be in Bible Baptist. You know what? I got a, I got another graphic. Let me get rid of this one here. I will be at Bible Baptist Church. You see the address there on the bottom, 105 Wygant Road, Horseheads, New York, 14845. Telephone number 607-330-330. 1206. You can call uh, the pastor there, Pastor Alex, and uh, get any more details. I, I do have the times for when I am going to be speaking there. It'll be Monday night, October the 21st at 7 p.m. Uh, Tuesday morning, there is going to be a pastor's meeting. I would say that probably all is welcome during that meeting. Uh, that will start at 9 o'clock, and I think there's some other speakers going to be speaking as well. And then Tuesday night, 7 p.m., again, that's Bible Baptist Church, 105 Wygant Road, Horseheads, New York, 14845, area code 607-330-1206. And uh, if you are in that area and you would like to attend, uh, we would, I would love for you to come. And uh, just maybe maybe meet some of you for the first time. It would be a blessing to me. It'd be a, I know it'd be a blessing to Pastor Alex. And uh, so anyway, make your way out there. I'm going to try to remember to post this on my blog. Uh, I'm going to tweet it, Facebook it, whatever. And uh, I hope that you will be able to attend. This is sort of just more or less a um, a Bible. I, I told Pastor we would we would just call it a King James Bible conference. Uh, this pastor is King James all the way, and I appreciate that and appreciate uh, the stand that he is taking uh, for the Word of God. And uh, I would like for you to just help support that meeting and help support uh, what it is he's doing out there. I don't, I've never met him. Uh, we, don't, we, don't, we don't go way back. Uh, we did, however, go to different schools together. And um, so anyway, I'm looking forward to the opportunity of meeting him and his, and his folks there and just... Um, uh, just being a blessing, just opening up, and let's just open our Bibles, and let's just uh, see where God uh, takes us. Um, I got a couple things to deal with as far as churches are concerned. Uh, somebody sent me this, and they said, Pastor, this is, now let me kind of set this up here. A few years ago, I became aware 
Uh, there's several ministries looking into this. Uh, Lighthouse Trails Research, they put out some good research on the emerging church. I don't agree with them on everything they say. Um, I, the, I don't think they take a very strong stand on the King James. Um, but anyway, they have come out with some good information. And a few years ago, I was made aware that there is a move afoot in the churches. Not, not only do you have the Bill Hybels slash um, uh, Rick Warren new paradigms, that's 20 cents if you're, you know, don't know what that is. Uh, the new paradigm of seeker-sensitive, user-friendly church. These people are not lost sinners, hell-bound. They are seekers seeking for something. I almost fell into that uh, back in the 90s. That's what I was going to do. I was going to take this church and emerge it. I was I, Actually, I didn't know what emerging was back then. But I was going to, I was reading books on, one of them was called Church for the Unchurched. That's what That was the title of the book, and it was talking about how all these leaders, like Hybels and Rick Warren, I'd never heard of these guys before, were, were taking over. Man, they were showing everybody how to do it. And they give you this idea that here's what Rick Warren did. He goes to Orange County, California. Now, I don't know if you've ever been there or know anything about it. Orange County, California, probably outside of maybe New York, New York City, is probably one of the wealthiest counties in the entire nation. There is a lot of money in this county. So Rick Warren feels God calling him to this area. So he goes around, he knocks doors with a little clipboard, and he's asking people, if I were to start a church in this area, what would it take to get you into my church. In other words, what would you want me to do to get you in the doors of my church? So that's what he did. He went around asking lost people or faraway church people, asking them, what kind of music do you like? What kind of music do you want me to play? Not, not even bother to consult the scriptures, consult the, consult the Bible, Can ask the Holy Ghost. Ask the lost man. Let the lost man's going to tell you how to have church, how to preach, what to preach about. And so this was the paradigm that he did. And so he built this church from like, I don't know, 20, 30 people. You know the story, 50 people or whatever. Now it's the mega church. Now everybody's doing it. And then, then he writes the book, The Purpose Driven Church. And everybody's following this new paradigm shift that we, if we're going to keep up with the fast-paced 21st century, we have to build our churches this way, and I was going to fall for it. I was going to dumb down my sermons. I was listening to Amway motivational tapes. I was going to um, try all these programs to get people to come in the building, and so they'd know that, you know what I was trying to do? I was trying to dress the church up like a harlot, so people would notice us. That's what I was trying to do. That's what churches are doing. They're dressing themselves up like harlots so people notice, watch this now, the church instead of her husband. And they're lusting after and wanting the church rather than the husband of the church. And I was going to do that so much so that I was going to have a rock and roll concert in the sanctuary of Bethel Church. Heavy metal, hard stuff. And God chastened me over that, whooped me pretty good. And I said, God, it's your church. Handed him the keys. Here you go. You can have it. You just tell me what you want me to do and I'll do it. Okay? And so I, when I, that was God saying, Mike, you don't understand the danger. I do. I know where it's going. I know where it came from. So in, in a lot of, and I tell people this, in your absence of understanding God, just believe him. Believe what he said and, and do what he said. You may not understand. A, a three-year-old child cannot in, in their mind even conceive of why any parent would have a problem with them jumping up and down on the bed. 
No, I cannot conceive that in my mind as a three-year-old child. But the parent knows. They know that, number one, that child is more than likely going to beat his head on something in that room. They know that danger is just around the corner. They know that, and they say, stop it. Now, and you never explain to a three-year-old child, now listen, Johnny, let me tell you exactly what's going to happen. Let me show you the medical bills that's going to, they don't care. They don't believe it. You just tell them, stop. Well, come, because I said so. Now, as they grow older, you start explaining, and that's what God did. He just told me, stop, Mike, stop it. You don't understand the danger. You don't understand where this move comes from. So I did. But as time went on, God began to make me aware of what was going on. That was the 90s, 90, 1996, 97, I think, somewhere around in there. I actually, somebody showed me a bulletin they kept. I announced it, rock and roll for your soul. Oh, I've apologized to my church several times for this, but that's what I was going to do. And God said no, and I, and I said, okay, God, you're in charge. And then God began to show me. It's just like with the, with the King James Bible. God said, this is my word. It has no errors in it. I accepted that right then and there. I just believed God, even though I didn't understand everything that I understand now. Now I get it. I get it. I look at this book, and I say, this is the inspired, inerrant word of God. And now I can show people. I can go to Horseheads, New York, and show people why it says it's the Word of God, why it says it's inerrant, why it says that it's been preserved and translated right so that my thinking is just left out of the scene. Now we just see it from the Bible very clearly. And so I began to be aware of a, of a movement called the Emergent Church or the Emerging Church. And that, that phrase in itself was pretty interesting. And I'm going... Something that is submerged is something that emerges. You don't emerge without being submerged. And I want you to think about that concept. I want you to think about something that rises up from the depths. I want you to ponder that because when you look at the phrase emerging church, it, it, it itself is indic in indicating, indicative of something that is under something, under the ground, under the sea, under the water. And it's going to rise up, and it's going to take over the world. And this movement has taken off in spite of the warnings that people have been given and the, the work that you know we've tried to do, Lighthouse Trails Research. Other ministries have tried to do this, trying to warn people about it, but it just it's taking hold. It's in the former denomination. Well, it's still the denomination. We're just formerly used to be a part of it, the Free Will Baptists. It's in the Southern Baptist, the Nazarene movement. Uh, I have uh, friends, followers of this ministry that uh, one family in particular, uh, man, I tell you what, I just, I've, I've wept for them when I heard their story. She told me, she said, we have been part of the Nazarene church for all of our lives. And now there is not a single church that we can go to anymore. And I've listened, she sent me some CDs and some teachings that uh, she became aware of. All of the Nazarene universities are promoting contemplative prayer and emergent theology and all of this modernity stuff. And uh, she sent me a CD. I listened to one of them, and this guy teaching at a Nazarene gathering was talking about how we need to intuit God's voice, which means that we need to feel it with the creative side of our brain instead of just reading it from the text of the Bible. That's the move that they're trying to make here. Well, this one here really, really caught my eye. You know what? I'm going to add, before I show you this, I'm going to add a graphic. Uh, and you know what? I just, uh, I just took it off um, the other day. Let me see if I can find it. Here it is. I'm going to show you this graphic. You remember this? I saw this while watching MasterChef UK, The Professionals. And uh, it's a Jenny Craig commercial, and what you're looking at is a 666. You're looking at a hexagon. You're actually looking at three of them, three six-sided figures. And you are, you are 
being inundated with that imagery. If you have had a chance to watch this week's Watchmen broadcast, um, and let me stop right here. If you've had a chance to watch this week's Watchmen broadcast, and you don't like the beginning music that I put in there, let me know. Okay? Because... They heard it downstairs yesterday for the first time. Alicia and Gary and Kay and Jason and Andrea and Roy and Bonnie and Dee. And they're all down there. And I get a call. And their inwards just shot out of their body when they heard this new music. I mean, it's not anything, it's not a cult, anything like that. They're just going, he changed the music. Ooh. Oh. So if you don't like it, let me know. I will not get my feelings hurt, all right? I've been experimenting around with some new things and a new look and so on and so on. You know, and you're just trying to keep it fresh. Anyway, if you got a chance to watch this week's Watchmen broadcast, you know, and I shared this on Pastor Mike Online, the idea of Saturn being like a picture of the wheel within the wheels and the rings in Ezekiel chapter 1 and the hexagon that's on top of Saturn and what that means. Basically, it represents the number 6 is what it does. And here you have 666. Six, six, six. That's what you're looking at right here. This stuff is going into our minds, and it's, and it's hitting people in the subconscious level. And I believe that, it's, that all of these, these symbols and these images are drawing people. It's called perception without awareness. Your brain picks up on it and can hold the information for a limited time. But the more you're inundated, the more you're flooded with it, the more that there is a shift in your paradigms. And you start thinking the way that it's programming. It's what it is. It is subversive, subconscious programming, getting people to th make a decision, which everybody's going to make here before too long. Here is, uh, she sent me this, or he or who, I can't remember who it was, sent me this picture. Pastor Mike, got to take a look at this. I saw this, and you'll get it. Here's the hexagons. This is from a movement called the Underground Church. Now, I get it. I get it. I understand what this is. But notice, notice the hexagons here, and you have three of them prominent right there in front of you. Leadership training course, three hexagons right in front of your eyes. Six, six, six. And I want you to combine this with what you see there as far as the underground network, the underground movement. Let me, let me, let me show you a little bit of uh, something that I learned about while doing. This goes back a few years when I was doing the research for the Da Vinci Code. I was reading several books that apparently he based his information on. And what I found out was that there is, if you've ever heard of Arcadia, uh, no, that's something beside a small town in Illinois or Indiana or wherever. There's an Arcadia in a bunch of states all across the country. If you've ever heard of Arcadia, ar there is a painting called The Shepherds of Arcadia. And in this painting, um, and, you know, this comes up as far as the artwork and Da Vinci and everything like that. You have these three shepherds and a pregnant woman. You can tell she's pregnant. She's got a little pooch in her belly, like mine. But mine's shrinking. Anyway, um, these, these three shepherds, and they're standing in front of this coffin. And this woman is standing by the coffin with her pregnant belly. And... There's not a whole lot there. There's no writing or anything like that. Uh, well, there is. Et in Arcadia Ego. Is there, there's a writing on the side of this stone concrete coffin. Et in Arcadia Ego is Latin. I think it, it means uh, I am also in Arcadia or I myself am in Arcadia. And the shepherd, one of the shepherds is pointing to the coffin. Um, now, next week in uh, the Watchman broadcast, I'll, I'll show you a little bit of the symbol of the coffin. I'm going to talk about the power of the grave. We're dealing with powers in the fourth kingdom. 
And the coffin is an interesting uh, idea in the occult and in Freemasonry, secret societies, things like that. Uh, there's this idea of a coffin. There's something in that coffin that needs to come out. The coffin represents Arcadia. And you find out that Arcadia is this idea that um, there has been throughout history an underground stream of mystic knowledge. Let me show you this again. Arcadia represents an underground stream of mystic or secret knowledge that various people throughout history have tapped into this stream or drank from this stream. My appreciation goes to the fellow that came all the way down from uh, Canada to show me in the Bible the two rivers. And once he began to lay it out for me, I'm going, I get it. I get it. There are two streams in the Bible, just like there are two Jesuses in the Bible. There is the stream that flows out of the throne of God. There is, and it's a clear stream, clear, pure, clear as crystal. Then there is the muddy stream. If you read Ezekiel 32, you'll find the whale that muddies the waters. It is a dirty stream. It is a stream where the, the secret lies buried. Do you know anything about the word, if I say the word sticks, S-T-Y-X, does that ring a bell to anybody? Yeah, the rock group. Oh, oh no, I don't listen to that stuff anymore. Sticks, supposedly, is the underground river that flows through hell. That's what Arcadia represents, an underground stream of... Now, it, I'm kind of putting all this together, and I, this may show up in the fourth kingdom. I don't know where to put it yet. But if you read Genesis chapter 2, you'll find the river Styx. I believe you'll find it there. It's not called Styx. It's called the river Euphrates. And, and when you look at that in Genesis 2, and then you match it with what you see in the book of Revelation, that in the river Euphrates, there are four angels bound up in the river that are going to be loosed one of these days. Okay? Um, and by the way, the river Euphrates is the fourth river mentioned in Genesis chapter 2. So I think there's something there. And so here we have this under Arcadia, this underground stream of occult knowledge, and it contains a secret, and that secret's going to come to the surface one of these days. Uh, there was a TV show called Joan of Arcadia. You remember that? And Joan of Arcadia was this lady that was being called of quote-unquote God, uh, and she said she could see God in everybody. God always showed up in every episode of this TV show um, as a different person. And God had a mission for her. Well, that's where they got it from. They got it from uh, just about everybody who was in the, um, oh, what was it? The Priory of Zion uh, was given the title of John or Jean. And so you have Joan of Arcadia. And I'm, I'm going, I get it. I understand what that is. I went to the website of this underground church movement because I'm looking at the graphic and I'm seeing, okay, yeah, yeah, I see three sixes here. I wanted to look into it a little bit further. Um, let me see here. I didn't, I didn't show you the whole thing here, but let me give you uh, the website address, tampaunderground.com, tampaunderground, all one word, dot com. You can go there. And you can see, do you see what I see? Okay, we're looking at, I'm looking at it. It's called the underground, the church, the network, the movement. What is the underground? The underground is a new kind of church made up not just individuals, but communities and so on and so on. Now I'm going to stop right here. A new kind of church. Let's take that and let's go to uh, the scriptures. What is the church? If you look in, in um, let's go to the book of Acts. That kind of jumps out at me. The book of Acts, chapter, oh, let's see here, chapter, chapter 2. Uh, this is uh, the Holy Ghost being poured out, 
This is Peter preaching uh, the word of God. He's saying this is that which was prophesied. And the Bible says, um, uh, verse 41, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And uh, let's see here. Where am I? What am I looking for? Okay, verse 47, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord, the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. That is the church. It is what the Lord adds as his body, his bride, and the Lord adds them, and not man. And then it is those who are born again. So the question in my mind is, why do we even need a new kind of church, and whose idea was it? Because I can tell you that every cult movement, just go back and look at the history of it. Go back to uh, this guy named Joe Smith. Joe Smith uh, has the idea that all the churches are wrong. They're all doing it wrong. They've gotten away from what God originally designed. And so I'm going to add a New Testament here, and I'm going to straighten. God has called me to straighten the whole mess out. Charles Taze Russell, the exact same thing, comes out years later and says, the whole church is wrong. Everybody's got it wrong. I'm going to straighten it all out. That's the Jehovah's Witness movement. Ellen. Ellen Jezebel White says, if all, you're all wrong. You've got it all wrong. God gave me visions, extra biblical revelations. And I'm telling you, all of these cults, they all have something in common. They all add to or take away from the written record of the Word of God in order to prove their point. They say, the Bible's all wrong. You don't get it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to straighten it all out. So that's what Ellen White did, Seventh-day Adventist movement. Um, the, um, the Azusa Street Revival. Same thing. It's like it's all the churches are bad. Don't go to any of them. They've been denying the Holy Spirit. Now we're gonna we're gonna straighten everybody out. We're gonna bring in this new pair of dimes, and we're gonna we're gonna fix the whole church problem. Same thing. United Pentecostal movement. Same thing. They all everybody's got it wrong. We're gonna fix it. Now the emergent church comes along, and the underground church comes along and says we need we're gonna have a new church because all the other church doesn't work. It's fake. It's phony. It's 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 hierarchized. In other words, there's this evil thing in all these churches called a pastor. Well, we don't have anything like that in our churches. We don't have pastors in our churches. We're doing it the right way. Really? Because I'm pretty sure that it was, no, I know for a fact that it was God who calls people to be bishops and pastors and puts them over churches. Somebody sent me, I, I just glanced at it. I don't remember who did it. Uh, if you're listening today, I'm going to answer your question. Someone said, I, you know, I think I, I can kind of see in the Bible where there should be a two-pastor system in the church, and I'm going to politely but strongly disagree with that. No man can serve two masters. There are no two-headed people running around. Well, let me take that back. There's a couple of teenage girls that were conjoined twins, and they it's really neat to see how these girls get along. They had two heads, and they were both conjoined into the same body. Uh, really fascinating um, how they, they drive a car. They swing a baseball bat. How they do that, I don't know. But it's an abnormality, an anomaly. It's not how it's supposed to be. And so you must only have one head, a pastor, a bishop, and he's under the authority of the scriptures, they're supposed to be. So anyway, um, I said I was going to take questions here. I am rambling again. But let me just kind of go through this again. This underground church, I want you to notice if you're looking at the website, on the right side it says our story, our manifesto, and then crucible. You click on that. And that is the name of, I guess, the head church. It's called the Crucible. Now, I'm looking at that, and I'm going, what in the world is a Crucible? Because, you know, I heard there was a play, Arthur Miller play, called The Crucible. 
uh, dealt with the Salem Witch Trials. There's a movie came out in 1996, The Crucible, based on the play. But I didn't know what a crucible was. Didn't sound right to me. Didn't, I didn't see it anywhere in the Bible. What is a crucible? I looked it up. I went to en.wikipedia.org, and I looked up what a crucible was. A crucible is a, a vessel of clay that you pour molten iron into. You get it? The idea of the crucible, why they call their church this, why is it underground? Why, why is it that their teachings are coming up from underground subversively? Why do they call it the crucible? Because the crucible is a vessel of clay that contains hot molten iron. That's how it's heated up, and it can extend the extreme temperatures. Go look this up. I, was, I went, oh! So if you see this somewhere, you get it. That's Daniel chapter 2. They, the iron, mingles themselves with the miry clay, the vessels of clay, the earthen vessels. That's what they do. That's what that's all about. Um, let me read a verse here I pulled up about, um, I, had, I had this in my mind, the, the underground, the pit. Um, let's see here. Psalm 715, he made a pit and digged it and has fallen into the ditch, which he made. And I want you to remember that you look in Proverbs chapter 23, verse 27 for a whore is a deep ditch and a strange woman is a narrow pit. What spirit operates and, and uh, builds this church. What spirit is that? It's not the Holy Spirit. It is mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, whose sole purpose is to prepare the way for the Iron Kingdom to come about. And it's coming up from the same place where the waters of Noah came up. They came, the fountains of the great deep opened up. And that's what this is all about. I thank you, whoever sent that to me. I really mucho appreciado. Uh, this was sent to me as well. Church of England creating pagan church to recruit members. Uh, the church is uh, training ministers to create, quote, a pagan church where Christianity is very much in the center to attract spiritual believers. Ministers are being, tra uh, let's see here, Reverend Steve Hollinghurst. A researcher and advisor in new religious movements told the BBC, I would be looking to formulate an exploration of the Christian faith that would be at home in their culture. See, that's mingling. That's mingling is what that is. You, you just stay a pagan. We're going to come in and mix Christianity with paganism because, after all, it worked for C.S. Lewis and J.R.R.R.R.R.R.R.R. Tolkien. It worked for them, and that's what we're going to do. And you see the paganization of the church everywhere. Um, and I'm kind of going through some things. I went through the emails uh, before the show today. And uh, you all just be patient with me and pray for me. Uh, I am like pulling double duty with everything. Uh, doing all the um, video editing and trying to take care of this and trying to take care of that. And then try to read emails when I can. And it, it just gets overwhelming. Uh, I've got good people around here that have been helping me a lot, and I appreciate that. But just be patient with old Pastor Mike, if you don't mind, all right? Uh, my friend, let me just say this. My first responsibility to God and kingdom is to give attention to the Word of God. That is my first primary responsibility. Uh, and that's really, I think, why you're here, is because of the Word of God. The, 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 my church here, Bethel Church, and its people and my wife and family, that is my secondary obligation. 
Um, I just came from the hospital today. My mother-in-law's having surgery. She got some kind of bad, nasty knot around her thumb here, carpal tunnel and some kind of cyst there. Uh, she just came out of surgery. She's in recovering room now. Pray for her. But I just left the hospital a little while ago, came over here. Um, and so anyway, the, it's the needs of my people here. And so I have to take care of them. And then you guys, I don't like to put order. I don't like to put things in order, but there is an order. And uh, so anyway, if I, if I don't get to, to the emails, please, please, please forgive me. There are, there's somebody's reading your emails. Somebody is here, people that I trust. And if it's orders, they'll take care of it or watchers list. They're working on the watchers packets right now. And uh, so it's pretty busy around here. Um, who sent me this? Eric sent me this. He said, um, there is, um, his son is a freshman at a local high school. And he noticed that there is a reading list that was sent home, if I'm getting this right, of books that they were supposed to read. This is, uh, like I say, freshman high school level. We're not talking about fourth, fifth grade. We're talking about a freshman high school level here. So they can kind of understand some things. The, one of the books that's on the reading list, and Eric, as you might assume, had a pretty big problem with it, and he sent me the letter that he wrote to the school. He said, I haven't, haven't heard back from him. I don't know why. One of the books is called The Alchemist. Let me explain what alchemy is. Alchemy is... On the surface, it looks like it's going to turn lead into gold. But what it really is, is alchemy is part of, it's part of Arcadia. It's part of the underground stream. Because what alchemists were working on was the ability to turn men into gods. Harry Potter. Um, in the first Harry Potter book, the Philosopher's Stone or the Sorcerer's Stone. In the first Harry Potter book, they deal with the alchemist Philosopher's Stone and a man by the name of Nicholas Flamel. Nicholas Flamel, he's on the Grandmaster list of the Priory of Zion. He is an alchemist, and supposedly Nicholas Flamel found the Fountain of Youth that Google's searching for. Google has four colors in it. Go look. The Fountain of Youth, the Philosopher's Stone, that when you take it or ingest it, you become immortal. And so here is Harry Potter, and he is meeting Nicholas Flamel, who lived, I don't know, three, four, five hundred years ago, six hundred years ago, something like that, but he's still alive. And so these young people are reading a book that teaches the basic philosophical tenets of the mystery cult of alchemy and learning that men can be transformed into immortals precisely the way Lucifer talked about in the Garden of Eden. So you can imagine Eric's distress over this he doesn't want this to and he went through the book and uh, I'm just going to highlight a couple things here uh, he asks a question does the alchemist not teach a child that he can be a god and perform miracles and he gives a quote from the book the boy reached through to the soul of the world and saw that it was part of the soul of God and he saw that the soul of God was his own soul and that he, a boy, could perform miracles. That's a direct quote from the book, The Alchemist. And then he says, uh, the boy was taught the Luciferian concept that he can become anything created in the universe. Again, he quotes directly from the book. You can't be the wind, the wind said. We're two very different things. That's not true, the boy said. I learned the alchemist's secrets in my travels. I have inside me the winds, the deserts, the oceans, the stars, and everything created in the universe. We were all made by the same hand. We have the same soul. I want to be like you, able to reach every corner of the world across the seas, blow away the sands that cover my treasure, and carry the voice of the woman I love. That, again, is from the book The Alchemist. He says... Um, Lucifer uses all manner of signs and knowledge to portray himself as God from the alchemist. He saw that omens were scattered throughout the earth and in space and that there was no reason or significance attached to their appearance. He could see that, that not the deserts, nor the winds, nor the sun, nor people knew why they had been created. That's not true. 
you could know it if you'll read the Bible. But that the hand had a reason for all this, and that only the hand could perform miracles or transform the sea into a desert or a man into the wind. I'm going to, as part of the powers series from the fourth kingdom, I'm going to talk about things that have the power in the hand. If you want to send me anything that you know concerning that, show me, I don't know, logos, signs, power in the hand, Iron Man, Ultraman. You remember Ultraman? I am number four, had power in his hand. I'm going to be talking about it. So if you got anything relevant, send it to me. I'm looking for stuff. Uh, anyway, um, and that only the hand could perform miracles or transform the sea into a desert or a man into the wind. Transformation here. Did you catch that? That's what alchemy is all about. Because uh, only the hand understood that it was a larger design that had moved the universe to the point at which six days of creation had evolved into a master work. The, the idea of the master work is what's in at the core of Freemasonry. And so, Eric, I appreciate you sending this. This is what our children, and there's all kinds of stuff in here about alchemy and magic and the four elements and everything. And, uh, Eric, I'm going to save this as part of my notes, and I appreciate uh, and I, I may find some way of incorporating that into the Watchman broadcast. But you can see what he's up against. Here he is, this school, this public tax-funded school, is trying to, is trying to uh, teach his Christian son elements of witchcraft and paganism and magic and sorcery and alchemy. All of this is the devil's religion. All of it points you to what we see in Daniel chapter 2 in the fourth kingdom. And Eric, the dad, saying, you know what? I'm supposed to be battling principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual. I'm supposed to be battling this. So, Eric, I appreciate you standing up. You may not get anywhere. But remember, we win when we stand and don't move and don't draw back. That's how we win. Eric keeps standing. Um, several people sent me this in the last couple of days. I have not heard this particular broadcast, but I have three witnesses that were all telling me the same thing. If you want to go and listen to it uh, and just check out the accuracy of the information that I'm about to share you. And, I, and I'm saying that because, again, I have not heard out of their mouth what they said. I'm talking about Brandon House, Jimmy DeYoung. I'm a little bit familiar with Brandon House, uh, but not Jimmy DeYoung. But apparently, and Brandon House has a sort of like a radio show on the internet or whatever, kind of doing something similar to what I'm doing, Chris Pinto and others are doing. But Brandon has taken the, uh, the mainstream idea of the, of the stand on the King James Bible. Uh, and I have read some things from his website. I've shared it with people. Uh, he's dead wrong. He is absolutely dead wrong scripturally on his stance on the Bible. He has taken the mainstream concept. Uh, I don't know why. I don't know if that's what was given to him in Bible college or whatever, but that's the stand that he's taken uh, in that the King James is wrong, uh, and he can prove it apparently, and he thinks the King James only people are dangerous and you shouldn't belong to that. And I've had several people, Arlene for one of them, uh, send him email after email pleading with him, please don't say that. Please, we like your information. Please don't do this. And it just goes unheard. So now, and I'm going to read you the email. This is from Paula. Paula says, uh, hi, Pastor Mike. This question might, fit, might not fit into what you're talking about, but I just heard Brandon House and Jimmy DeYoung discussing whether someone can receive the mark of the beast and then repent and be saved. Now, if you, I've talked about this before, apparently in, well, not apparently, I've read the quote uh, from, um, uh, my mind just drew a blank, the guy that wrote the, uh, the Rapture series, okay? Not my Rapture series, not mine. God wrote that script. Um, anyway, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, Left Behind, Tim LaHaye. There's a, a, a part of that series, a book called The Mark, and in it, there's this discussion going on. These people are in the tribulation or whatever, 
And this guy, all of a sudden now, he got he got marked. He's got the mark of the beast on him. And he's going, I didn't want this. Uh, uh, am I going to go to hell because I, I, I have the mark? And they're saying, oh, no. Not if you really repent because... God doesn't look on the outside. He only looks on the inside. And so if you just tell God, God, I I didn't want this, then God will say, don't worry about it, because I only look on the inside, not on the outside. And that was their, that was their flimsy, as far as the Left Behind series, that was their flimsy, nonsensical, lame brain idea spreading it out to people all over the world that if you find yourself getting the mark of the beast if later on you repent of it it'll be okie dokie with God you're going to go to heaven anyway in strict violation against the contract of the New Testament Let's open up our can. This, see, this is what happens when you decide to go word shopping. And what I mean by that is you won't stick to the Bible that's been around for 400 years because you don't like some of the things it says. It's pretty harsh. So you go word shopping. You go from this Bible to that Bible to the next one to find out what what you what pleases you what you like what says what you want it to say and then that's what you start telling people so let's use our king james pure bible search software type in the word mark and let's go to oh let's see here let's go to revelation 15 2 and i saw as it were a sea of, of glass mingled with fire and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name Four things there. Stand on the sea. Revelation 16, 2. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the... See, this is wrath. God promises wrath. The first went out, poured out, poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome, grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. Revelation 19, 20. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, which, with which he deceived them that it received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive in the lake of fire, burning with, uh, burning with, uh, burnt with brimstone. Revelation 20, verse 4. Read it. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, nor it, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. Did you catch that? And they lived and reigned and shall reign with a thousand years with Christ. The Bible specifically says that if you receive the mark, if it's on you or in you, in your right hand or in your forehead, if you have it, you will not live. The vial of God's wrath is poured out upon you. It does not say anything in there about, well, maybe you, maybe you didn't want it. Maybe you realized after you got it that it's not so good thing after all. And I mean, after all, I mean, I'm going to give every That is unscriptural. Second Thessalonians 2 tells us, For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. What, tell me, what in the scripture makes you think that anybody, after they receive the mark, is going to wake up and say, I don't want this. God, can, can I still go to heaven? And God says, you know, I wrote it in the book that, you know, I'm not supposed to let you, but you know, Maybe I will. I want to tell you something. If God lets one person into heaven that has the mark of the beast on them, he must then open the gates of hell itself and let everybody that's in there out and let them come to heaven. 
That's what he has to do. If God is not just, then he's not God. So let me continue reading this. According to the three emails I got, you go listen for yourself. Tell me if there's anything, and I'm serious, tell me if there's anything that I mischaracterized Brandon House and Jimmy DeYoung. Uh, Brandon plays a clip from John MacArthur saying the same thing. They do not quote scripture, either one of them. They both say that because there will be living people to populate the kingdom and everyone has to take the mark of the beast, there must be some who take it and then repent and live to enter the kingdom. That's not true. It's not true. It's a lie. And so I'm going to encourage you, double back on this. I don't have the time right now. Double back on this. Listen to what they said. Transcript it if you, if you can. Just I don't need the whole show, just that relevant part. Transcript it. Write down what they said. Send it to me, word for word. Because if they said this, That, I, that is unimaginably dangerous and irresponsible to go outside of the barriers of the written word of God, the contract that we have with God, and declare to a Christian audience that God is going to violate his own word and let people who have taken the mark off the hook. If that's the case, and these guys really believe this, and they taught that, we're not brethren, because we don't have the same father. Just telling you what I think. If, if they said this, if Hal said it, DeYoung said it, John MacArthur said it, if they said it, give them space to repent. Let's see, let's see if they change what they've come up with. Let's see if they do, because I believe people should be given space to repent. I don't like, I don't like going after people like this. I don't like doing it. Um... But if they, if they said it, it comes out of their mouth, I got to say something. Um, who sent me this? Eugene has a question. He, he thinks I'm wrong on my position on being a Sabbatarian, a Sabbath worshiper. And... Um, He's talking about, he heard, he heard what I said about the whole idea of the fourth commandment. He said, uh, you mentioned that you spoke with a Seventh-day Adventist, and he told you that if you go to church on Sunday, you have the mark of the beast. Your response was that there are no scriptures that say you are to attend church on the Sabbath or Saturday to keep the fourth commandment. No, what I said was, if you can show me in the law, in the law, where, number one, we are commanded to publicly worship only on one day a week and forbidden from a worship, a public corporate worship, on any other day of the week. If you show that to me in the law, I will, I'll preach it from the highest rooftop. Uh, he said, the following scriptures, in my opinion... And I believe I have the Holy Spirit show that the children of God are supposed to meet together in a holy convocation on the Sabbath or Saturday, the seventh day of the week, to hear the scriptures read, not on Sunday, the first day of the week, the holy venerable day of the sun, capital S-U-N. Now, here again, this is, this is how they justify what they're teaching you in your mind. They, well, they're trying to convince everybody that the first day of the week is from hell, it's pagan, it's, it's of the sun god, sun worship, and you shouldn't have anything to do with it. Well, who made it? 
Who made the first day of the week? Who created it? God did. When, when did Satan take ownership of the first day of the week, or for the other six for that matter? When did the devil take ownership of it? And if you're going to apply that knowledge or that rhetoric or that concept, if you're going to follow that logic, then why are you worshiping on Saturn's day? Okay? And he, and he uses, um, uh, let's see here, Leviticus 23, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them concerning the feast of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feast. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest and holy convocation. Ye shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. Where, where is it? It's in their dwellings. But then he's got to give me a Hebrew lesson. Convocation from the Hebrew, michrach. Okay? I don't, I don't, sprechen's a Hebrew. I don't know what it, I don't know what it is. Um, and then he, then he quotes Luke 4, 16. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and as was his custom. That's not the law. That was the custom of the Jews, but that was not the law. He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath and they stood up for to read. Uh, then he quotes Acts chapter 13 where they did the same thing. Uh, Eugene, you did not, and, and I'm, I'm saying this nicely, you have not shown me from the law the commandment that I'm supposed to get in my car and drive to church on Saturday and I can't do it on the first day of the week or Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday or Friday. I can't, you're, you're telling me that I can't do that. And if I do it, I'm wrong. And I'm telling you, the law judges us, not what anybody else says. And you, you have not shown the law that commands that. And that's what I said. Uh, but I appreciate you writing in. Uh, you know, I'm going to wait on that. Bill O'Reilly wants to destroy your faith in Jesus and the Bible. Bill O'Reilly apparently wrote a book called Killing Jesus. Uh, a lot of comments here, but Bill O'Reilly is taking the position of the Holy Ghost. He says the Holy Ghost told him to write this book. Um, and he, said, he, he gives a, a statement like this. Jesus didn't say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do from the cross. The Catholic O'Reilly maintains. It wouldn't have been physically possible, he said. You die on a cross from being suffocated. You can hardly breathe. We believe Jesus said that, but we don't believe he said it on the cross because nobody could have heard it. And that's his, that's his logic that he gives out here. And uh, beware the leaven of Bill O'Reilly. Uh, let's see here. These stories can wait. I appreciate you sending them in. Uh, I do have one graphic I'm going to show you. Uh, you might recognize this. Um, Matt set this in. He said, this character is called Discord from the kid series, My Little Pony. He is a mix of a goat, a stag, an eagle, a lion, and a dragon. Notice, notice that this is Baphomet, it, right down to the hand gestures and the legs crossed and everything. See the, the, the two crescent moons? Everything about this is Baphomet, and this is in My Little Pony series. Matt, I appreciate you sending that my way. Um, and then, let's see here. Somebody's getting a lesson from their pastor or somebody on the benefits of tongues as a private supernatural prayer language. You know what? I'm going to save that. I'm going to hold on to that. And I may deal with that on Thor's day. Let's see what questions you have in mind for me today. Um, Kate says, I don't know if you may answer my question on air. I was wondering if you thought it was okay to listen to Tex Mars. I know he is a KJV preacher, wanted to know if he is like you or your prophecy ministry. Kate, Tex Mars, and I have almost nothing in common. Tex Mars, um, apparently... I don't know where he gets his doctrine from. You don't need to listen to Tex Mars, but just a little while to realize that he has got a serious problem with the people of Israel, the Jews. He has a mega, he hates them. 
In fact, he wrote an article, and I was just, I was floored that he said this. He wrote an article. I think you can find it on his website somewhere. He did a study of the book of Esther. You know the book of Esther where Haman was hanged on the gallows? Haman, the bad guy, hung on a tree? Why? Because he wanted to kill all the Jews. He wanted them annihilated. Esther was a woman that God raised up for such a time as that to save her people, her and, um, and Mordecai. God, you, and here's Mordecai come riding in on a white horse. Guess who that is? Tex Mars writes on his website in this article that Haman was the good guy here because he wanted, to re, he wanted to rid the world of this Zionist conspiracy that's taking over all the banks and taking over the world, the new world order. It's all a Jewish plot, a Zionist plot. And Haman's the good guy here. And Esther and Mordecai are these evil Jews who are trying to subvert the, uh, the kingdom there through uh, King Ahasuerus and having Haman uh, trumped up on false charges. I couldn't believe what I was reading. Tex Mars hates Israel. I will tell you, stay 50,000 miles away from Tex Mars and his theology. He's got a curse on him. Genesis 12. Go read it. Stay away from this guy. You had to ask. Greetings, Pastor Mike. I watched the last Watchman video, and I was wondering which church mentioned in Revelation is the Santa Claus dis deception ascribed to. I don't know. That's a new one for me. Uh, anyway, Lillian, Pastor Mike, please explain what happens when we die. Depends on who you are. Let me quote scripture. For it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. We all must, we all must go before the judge. Some are going to, who, who, and, and let me just say this, according to Scripture, everything that you and I did wrong against the law of God, written down in books. That's in the book of Revelation. The difference between born-again people and the rest of the world is that all the stuff that we did is blotted out or covered by the blood of Christ, and it cannot, the record's gone. There is no record now of what we've done. And we have, we are reconciled with God, and we are, in, are, to, are to be with Christ forever. The other people, when they die, let's, let's uh, go to Luke 16. The rich man was, and as soon as, he, as soon as he died, he woke up in hell. His judgment is coming, but it's later at the end of time. The great white throne judgment. All of these people are going to be resurrected from the dead, given a a a body, and then that body is going to be cast into the lake of fire. Why? Because their charges are still on the books, and they have not been covered with the blood. I hope that kind of helps you out, Lillian. hope it explains it. Uh, Marnie, hello, Pastor Mike. God bless and give you his strength to continue to stand firmly in his true word. I appreciate that. Oh, I just need your prayers. Uh, Nick says, I sent some pics to uh, your email address on the new big text. He is 55 feet tall, 25,000 pounds, and can move on 11. I uh, don't know what that is. Sorry. Uh, maybe help me out, all right? Matt. How you doing, Matt? Everybody pray for Matt. Matt's wife died in a car wreck a few weeks ago. Uh, I, I told him that, that grief would come in waves and it does. 
And those waves come in every now and then, and you pray for him, all right? Appreciate you writing in, Matt. Uh, Jeffrey, what is your feeling on home church meetings if we don't have a local church that isn't corrupted by guest Catholic speakers and rarely preaching from the Word of God? Jeff, here, this is why we do what we do. Uh, the Bible says not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, and I believe in that. But some have used that scripture as a weapon against people like you who you, you said, you know what, I can't go there anymore. I, I'm not taking my kids and putting them in your Sunday school class, and you're going to teach them contemplative prayer, and you're going to teach them rock and roll music, and you're going to teach them out of NIVs. I'm not doing that. And I want to tell you something, Jeff, you're not required to. You're going to give an account for how those children were taught. You're going to give an account for that. And so one of the reasons why we do what we do when we, when we stream our services live over the Internet, you become part of our extended congregation. You are meeting with us and assembling yourselves with us. We have the technology. We have the capability. We have the bionic church, as it were. I don't know if that's really true. But anyway, we are streaming our services live for people like you who have decided, I am not going to put myself under that man or woman's authority. I'm not doing it. That's not from the Word of God, and I'm not going to put my family under that either. So you know what? Have a home church. And you know what? Do what a, a church would do. Evangelize. Invite people over. Say, you know what? I'm part of this online church. Uh, I'm just asking you to come try them out. Just come listen to their service. They're, they're not much. They're not professionals. They're not slicked down, polished. They don't have a you know, million-dollar broadcasting center. But they're honest, good people. They're sinners. They wear bib overalls, and they believe in the Bible, and th that's who I'm a part of. Why don't you invite people over, Jeff, all right? Uh, and I, that is biblical. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, Terry says, I just want to thank you for being a good and faithful servant of Jesus Christ. Your teachings and insight of the Scripture have been such a blessing to me because of your teachings. I now have a better understanding and respect for the true power of the can of King James. Please continue with all the good work. Terry, you're one of the reasons why we're doing what we're doing. And uh, I love the comments and I love the testimonies from people who say, you know what, we, we just, now we're, st we are stuck on King James and King James stuck on me. I love that. I absolutely love that. And I never foresaw that that's what God was going to do when he called me into this ministry in 1997. I never had that in my mind, never did. Um, but I'm, I'm humbled by it. I, I am truly, I'm overwhelmed with um, the, the number of people. I, I can't get over the, um, uh, the laundromat guy. Guy goes to a laundromat down in Arkansas, someone someone copied our videos without our permission. <laughs> ah, thank you. You don't need my permission to copy those. Listen, I, God, God gave me that stuff for free. Why should I charge you for it or anybody else? Why should I go after you like um, Perry Stone, who's telling everybody in his magazine, his lawyers are writing a, a blurb in his magazine, take your Perry Stone videos down off your YouTube channel. That's, that's robbing us of money. Why should I do that? If Perry gets all his stuff from God, why is he charging anybody for it? It just doesn't make sense to me. So anyway, but you, some guy copied the videos, took them to a laundromat, just spread them out on the table. Guy walks in the laundromat, he's folding clothes, he sees all these videos out there. He's a Roman Catholic. He's just looking through them. He thinks he's going to take one home. He picks out another spirit, parts one and two. I don't even remember what's on there. He takes it home, watches it, comes back two hours later, and gets all the rest of the DVDs off the table. He's just, and he called our church and gave Kay his testimony. And um, that, that, I love that. Thank you. Whoever laid those videos out there, keep doing it. And all of you out there, keep doing it. Franklin writes, so God bless you, Pastor Mike, and everything you're doing for the Lord. In 78, God showed me his word when I picked up the 1611 King James Bible while visiting my mom. 
I had picked it up and read parts of it off and on for years, but never understood it. But in 1978, I started reading it again. This time, the words became alive and jumped off the pages and into my heart. By God's grace, I stumbled upon you uh, a couple of months ago, and it's so refreshing to hear you teach and preach from the precious King James Bible. Thank you so much. And, you know, I'd, I read these emails like this, not so I can puff myself up, but so that you out there know that you're not alone in this. You're not alone. There's others that you're going to get name called. You're going to get ostracized by everybody. But I'm telling you, you're not alone. Keep standing. Kate says, my husband and I were watching a program about the evil empire of Hitler. And of all things, he used the triketris. Did, really? Um, Kate, I would love a picture of, a picture of that. If you have it or can get one. Send it to me, please. I'll use it. Um, let's see here. Joe says, Dear Pastor Mike, how's it going? I emailed you a few weeks ago about a book I'd be writing about 1 John 5, 7, Minority Passages in the KJV and Absolute Bible Preservation. I'd ask you if you could write a foreword or preface to it. Uh, I would still like you to, but I need something more from you and your and your viewers. Prayer. I can't do this. Apparently, uh, Joseph, I remember reading the email. Forgive me for not, um, forgive me. I'm just kind of going through email here. Forgive me for not getting back with you. Um, I don't, let me just say this. If God told you to write it, write it. Um, and I, pr I appreciate what you're asking me to do. I really do. And so I don't want you to take this the wrong way. You don't need my endorsement. You don't. You don't need my endorsement on your book. You really don't. Because if God told you to write it, and it's the Word of God, and God's going to be honored in it, then He'll endorse it Himself. And He'll put that out there wherever fine books are sold or given away. He'll do it for you. Okay? That's... That's, I'm just kind of giving you some, some advice here, um, and I appreciate that. But I, uh, I'm going to decline your offer graciously, and I hope you don't hold it against me, all right? Sheila says, I miss the old Watchmen broadcast music. Okay. That's what I asked for. Um, Darlene says, Hi, Pastor Mike. I've been wondering, are you aware of the current hullabaloo regarding Chris Pinto and the beating he's taken from James White, Daniel Wallace, and Chris Putnam? He's standing strong for God's word while the elite seminarians as well as the amateur bloggers all band together and viciously attack him and all who are supportive of his battle. He truly seems like a David figure against the Goliaths of the modern seminaries. Do you have any words of wisdom or encouragement for him or even those of us who are catching flack for supporting him in this. Uh, Darlene, if they hate you, they hate God first. That's what I'm going to tell you. And, and I've met Chris. I sat down, broke bread with him, had discussions with him. I like Chris. Uh, he and I, I, I know some have said that he doesn't take the same view on the KJV that I do, that he's a Texas Receptus guy. Um, you know what? You pray for the man. I'm not going to treat him like an enemy because he doesn't, he doesn't follow what I say on that issue. Um, you pray for the guy, and he is taking flack because he, d he would not, I, I'm just assuming, I haven't talked to him in a couple of years, but I'm assuming that if you were to ask Chris, are you KJV only, he would say no, but he will only use the King James. Um, and so you pray for him, that if God is going to take him beyond that, that God will do it. But I'm just going to tell you, Darlene, when it comes to this stuff, here's one thing that you will notice that James White, Daniel Wallace, Chris Putnam can never do in their arguments. They can never prove their point by quoting Scripture. You can, and I encourage you to do it. Lawrence um, says, what, what does it mean, gold, silver, 
copper. It's not copper, it's brass. In the statue of Daniel 2. Um, I, one of the things I noticed, Lauren, is that the head of gold represents Nebuchadnezzar. That was the beginning as far as the linear time is concerned, the first kingdom. Something that's interesting to me is that this kingdom depreciates in value as it goes along. And I want you to follow this. It goes from gold to silver. Silver is precious, but it's not as precious as gold. Then it goes to brass, which is kind of like pseudo gold. But brass is, is a depreciation from silver. And then you have just iron. And that's like nothing. If someone gave you an iron necklace, if I, if I gave my wife an iron necklace for Christmas, I might be looking for the next Mrs. Hoggard sometime after that. Okay, just a joke, but you see what I'm saying. And, I, I, and what, one of the things that I see is in the devil's world, it always starts out good and shiny. And it all goes down from there. Whereas, rather from God, it all starts out as dirt. And then it shines forth like gold. You see the, you see the difference here? That's my spin on it. Tess says, I wanted to thank you for doing what you're doing. I almost a year in Christ now, and every day I learn more from the KJB, and I'm more and more grateful. Uh, I wonder if you got my email last week about the Kia commercial. I saw a shadow that looked like a horn thing and the four lights that looked like something. I uh, hope I can get to America in the future to visit. Hey, from Holland, Tessa, get on a get on a train and come on over here. And hold your breath because you'd be under the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, you know, I don't recall that. If you want to send it to me again, I would mucho apreciado. Okay, uh, Pastor Rob, I love you, brother, in Kentucky. He's on my back about the um, How I Escaped the Jehovah's Witness series from Brady. He's on my back about it. I don't know. Um, I'm, we're, we're making Watchmen packets right now. Um, me and Lindsay, or excuse me, Lindsay and myself are about the only two people here who know how to make a DVD, who know how to master a DVD. And, uh, and I'm not complaining, but Lindsay's out on maternity leave. So I'm having to make all the DVD. We got the videos, but I have to sit down and make the time to master the DVDs that they're going to go on. And I just have, I, there's a big sign on Lindsay's office door. <laughs> Every time I walk by it, it's reminding me, make the DVDs. Haven't done it yet. Okay. I know I, I want to get it out there. Um, so appreciate your, your forbearance. And he asked the question, what's the difference between kingdoms of God and kingdoms of heaven? Let me read to you a verse of scripture. Actually, and there's several of these. It's not limited to one. Some are saying that there is... A difference. Hang on here. I can't even write. Can't, can't type. K I N G D O M of heaven. Okay. Um, the phrase kingdom of heaven is only in the book of Matthew. All right. And some say that it is different from the kingdom of God. And I'm going to answer that uh, biblically. Okay, um, let's see here. Where can I start? Uh, let's see here. Ba -ba 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 that is given. Okay. Oh, okay. Here we go. If you compare Matthew thirteen eleven, everybody get your everybody get your King James out, and compare Scripture with Scripture. In Matthew thirteen eleven, he says, he answered and said unto them, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but unto them it is not given. That is the parable of the seed and the sower. If you will turn to Mark chapter 4, you're going to see that Mark says the kingdom 
of in Mark chapter 4, verse 11. Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. So is Matthew right and Mark wrong? No, they're both writing by inspiration of the Holy Ghost. And, and yet Matthew says kingdom of heaven, and he's the only one in the whole Bible that says that phrase. Mark writes the kingdom of God. So does Luke. And so what I believe that's telling you is that they are virtually identical. They are the same thing. God reigns over heaven, and his kingdom is going to come to the earth. Now, there is also another passage um, where it, it, it's in Matthew. It has to be. The kingdom of heaven is mentioned almost in the exact same place as the kingdom of God. Um, maybe if you find it before I do. Uh, let's see here. Uh, in the kingdom of heaven. Okay, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? No, let's see, kingdom of God. Let me do this. Let me do this. I know how to find it. Kingdom of God. And when I look for it in the book of Oh, Matthew, Matthew 19. Matthew 19. Turn there. Matthew 19, 23, and 24. Right out of the mouth of Jesus himself. You listen to this. Verse 23. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. The very next verse. And again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. He said it twice. He even said, again, I say unto you. You know what that means? He's telling you the exact same thing. But he says kingdom of heaven in one verse, and in the very next phrase, he says kingdom of God. Beyond that, if you'll study the kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God, if someone tells you that there is a difference, a, and let me just say this. There are some who base doctrine upon the premise that the kingdom of heaven is different than the kingdom of God. I do not see one single place in the whole of the King James Bible that tells you that the kingdom of God is not the kingdom of heaven. No place in scripture does that exist. It's not there. You find on the contrary, I've got two witnesses, the verses that I just quoted, that tell you that the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are the exact same thing. Now, if you think I'm wrong, quote scripture. Don't give me rationalizations. Don't give me, well, Matthew, he was speaking to this. And don't say that because that's not there. You, you have to make that up. You quote scripture to me and show me where the kingdom of God is different and not the same thing as the kingdom of heaven. And I'll just go back to Matthew 19, 23 and 24, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. Same thing. All right. Um, Pastor, I hope that um, uh, I hope that helps. Okay, I really do. Um, and again, there are some people who make a big deal about that, and I just don't see it. I really don't see it in the scriptures. All right, uh, you know, sorry I couldn't get to um, all your emails today. Uh, I'm having fun here. May do the same thing again Thursday. I like for us to just sit down and just have a little chat. All right. And uh, it kind of helps me a little bit, too, in preparing for a lot of things. I'm sitting over at the hospital with my mother-in-law, and I'm taking notes on the Pure Bible Study. I mean, that's what I'm doing. So it kind of helps me a little bit. All right. Hey, I love you. God bless you. And you know what? If you disagree with me on anything that I said today, remember, let God be true and every man a liar. Okay? So maybe I'm not right on something. But the Word of God, the King James Bible is. I got an email from a guy who said, Pastor, I appreciate the respect that you had. He said, I am a pre-trib guy. And he said, I appreciate what you said about, you know, I, I believe the Bible. And I mean that. I really do. If you believe that book, 
we be brethren. All right. We will see you tomorrow. God bless you. Adios.